I do humbly pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. One of the more famous passages of scripture. You see it at football stadiums around the world. Not the words, but John 3, 16. I remember it from a child. I heard it week in and week out at church. It was part of the comfortable words from the Book of Common Prayer. My mother sat between me and my brother, either at eight o'clock or at the 10 o'clock service. And after the confession of sin, the priest would say, hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not for ours only but for the sins of the whole world. I've carried these words with me through my lifetime. Long before I was a priest, first I heard them, and then I said them to myself. As an adult, I said them to me. I said them as a prayer, particularly when I was lost, out of sorts, discouraged about my faith and my life in Christ, when I felt humiliated because of my actions as a human being and as a Christian. But they were also words of strength for the place I was in spiritually and morally. They lifted me up. And so today I would hope we could spend some time with the words of Thomas Cranmer, who authored these words in the 1500s, 1600s, so eloquently from our prayer book, a direct, we are, and we have a direct descendant from the first prayer book of the Anglican Communion, authored by Thomas Cranmer. And he put the words almost poetically. God so loved the world that he gave his only son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And for a moment today, I'd like us to see the cross from the perspective of God, not simply from us. For me, the cross has always been that moment of destruction. How I loathe to hear and see the cross with our Lord Jesus Christ hanging upon it. And yet, in the years since, I have seen not only the cross as an instrument of death, but an instrument of hope and love and the faith that has been commended to me that I take to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the fourth Sunday of Lent, we hear these words. We hear them from Jesus himself. It is done in the darkness. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the cover of darkness and he's looking for answers and he has questions. Questions about his faith and about what it means to have that living faith 
that he was searching for, but was elusive for him. Here's a man, a learned man, who came to Jesus by night in the cover of darkness to get to some answers. And Jesus begins by talking about what is flesh is flesh, what is born of the, f of the Spirit is born of the Spirit. And with that, Jesus launches into his famous sharing of a conversation with Nicodemus. Here are the first words that you hear in the gospel today. Just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That is exactly what was said in the scripture today from Numbers. If you look at it, it is the story of Moses and the people who murmured because they were without food. They were out the comforts of what was expected in Egypt. And they were bitten by snakes. And Moses lifts up and has a fashion, a bronze serpent. And all who gauged on that serpent were saved from the um, ravages of the snakes. Jesus uses that topography here today. And he looks at us and says, just as Moses lifted up the servant in the winter, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so today, the fourth Sunday of Lent, we come as close as we've come all Lent to the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and the cross. And it's well that we pay attention to that on this fourth Sunday. We can imagine Nicodemus's bewilderment as Jesus takes him to a place of the heart that is not written down or memorized or even familiar. In, his long, in this long season of Lent, we need to hear Jesus speak as if we were listening for the very first time. Come unto me. And then he says, right after that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have life eternal. At some deep level within me, I have come to believe over and over again that Jesus and his sacrifice is the ultimate manifestation of God's love. And so the cross is not simply an instrument of death. It's an instrument of life for me and for you. For renewal of life. Not out here, but in here at our deepest level where we live most profoundly. Christ speaks to us. And I would say to you, the cross is that unmerited love for you and for me. Over and over and over again. That cross was not in vain, but provided a setting for us. I have uh, found myself as Paul would say, doing the same things over and over again. Have you ever done that? Have you ever said to yourself, I'm not going to do that again? And keep doing it over and over and over again. And yet the cross looms in front of us over and over again. That cross of love, that cross of hope, that cross that says to us, we have newness of life, not out here, but through Christ within us. And that newness of life makes all the difference about who we are and what we're about as we move into this world. The nature of Jesus is no different on the cross than he was in life. If you notice, he does the parable of the prodigal son. 
in which a father greets his son from a long distance away and puts a ring on his finger and takes him home and then has a party. The son comes limping home to the only home he knows, the only father he knows, and there is greeted as a father only father could do. He shards him with love, much to the chagrin of the brother in the lower 40. I'm that lower 40 guy. Or can we remember the good Samaritan who stoops and goes to the man that looks dead and has the wherewithal to carry him on his mount, takes him to a place to refresh his body with nothing asked. Imagine God as the great shepherd who goes out and looks for the one lost sheep among the 99. Sometimes I'm that 99th sheep over and over again. Sometimes I need the love of God even when I cannot love myself. That's the kind of love that Christ offered on the cross. If you go to the great cathedrals, the great medieval cathedrals of Europe, you see Christ on the judgment seat and these huge murals. And you see those that are going to hate, those that are going to heaven. And the elect will go one way or the other. What you see now, particularly in the Enlightenment and in the Reformation, you see Christ, the Good Shepherd, the person that comes and kneels down and finds us, pursues us over and over again. That love never is extinguished. It's always present. One of the things that um, I have noticed in Lent, it is that it's the great season of uh, individualism. In other words, I find the cross and it's about me. And perhaps part of the problem is that self-awareness, that it's always about me rather than out there. Christ would say, perhaps, that the cross is not so much about me but the unity that I find in God and God finds in us. That great unity, that great oneness with God is found in Jesus Christ. And that cross is the example of that, is the living example of that in our lives. How precious that is to know that we have a God that loves us even in spite of ourselves. This came to roost uh, this morning about six o'clock. Um, I have a routine in the morning on Sundays. I like my space, I like my time. I have a certain set of things that I do and it's pretty regimented on Sunday morning. Well, my daughter and our grandson was, are visiting for about four or five days and before six o'clock, I was informed that he couldn't get on the internet and could I help him find the password to get on the internet before six o'clock. That's not what I wanted to hear. 
he was, he had a need and he was pursuing it. He didn't have a clue. And I wasn't very worthy. Pop Pop was not very worthy at that moment. I helped him, but there was um, a clenching of teeth in doing it. Do we find ourselves clenching our teeth in life? Do we find ourselves more interested in self than the world about us? Do we find ourselves meeting our own needs rather than looking out for the person next to us? And that's what uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, uh, said to us in a Latin sermon this year. He said, can you make space for other people? Because they're searching for their own redemption as well. Can you make space for the hurt and the pain that's out in the world? Can you make space for prayer that is not about simply you? but others who are in need for that redeeming grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things that I remember is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. In short, there are three things that last, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Faith that we put our trust not in ourselves, but the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hope that the world does not revolve around myself, but hope looks horizontally as well as vertically and that the world needs redeeming. And we're part of that redemptive act. And then he says, the last one, love. Love is always patient and kind. It is never rude or jealous. It never takes offense. That's the love that Christ shown on the cross. That love on the cross was the same love he shared with the world that gathered around him for three years. Can we have faith, even in the midst of difficulties? Can we have hope to see something out there more than simply ourselves? And can we love as Christ loved us? sharing the very nature of God within us to a world that desperately needs us. That could be part of our Lenten journey towards the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and our redemption as well. Amen.